All right, guys, this week we are going to be talking about the impact that television has had on the media industry. And one of the cool things about television is just that it was so impactful, not only when it first came out, but even today it still is as we have um, converged from watching traditional television at a certain time to being able to binge watch anything and everything on streaming services. So as we uh, go through, I want you to kind of think about your favorite shows and how they have developed from the history of television. So to begin with, um, in 1884, we had the invention of a small disc, the Nipkow disc. Um, and basically it was a rotating disc that allowed um, photoelectric um, cells to be passed through it. Um, it had about 4,000 pixels, which were the smallest picture element that could create an image at the time on a television or computer. Um, and this was monumental because it showed the possibility of projecting an image. Now, when we look back at film, we see that there was progression in this era, but this was a way to transmit it in a different way. Uh, later on, we see developments in this idea. We get the iconoscope tube, um, and then that eventually uh, develops into the kinescope. Um, and basically they're just enhancements on top of each other that take the idea of transmitting pixels as a picture um, and they enhance the picture quality in the technology. Now RCA hired um, Vladimir Zorkin who developed the last two developments um, as the head of their electronics research lab. And um, he got to work very quickly um, and partnered with Philo Farnsworth. And they created uh, the first teletype of an electric television system. Um, Farnsworth was only 15 at the time when he had kind of made um, a demonstration of a television. And um, Zorkin was like, okay. Um, we need this idea. And so they battled um, for patents about it um, back and forth. And finally, um, RCA in 1939 agreed to pay for the patent and his idea. And Zorkin took off with that. But when you really think about it, the idea of what the TV is now was made by a 15 year old and um, developed when he, you know, on and off until he was 20. That's very impressive. So y'all could have been that, doing that right now. Um, so that was in 1939. Um, the same year in April, RCA made their first true um, television broadcast. And it was um, a form of regularly scheduled two-hour NBC broadcasts. And that uh, was a variety show. So they would have different things like cooking demos, singers, jugglers, comedians, um, other types of entertainment. Um, and they would rotate through these things. The thing about the first television broadcast and broadcast after were that um, televisions were expensive. So you could buy um, a television um, at the World's Fair that year. And um, for a five inch screen, it was $200. For a 12 inch screen, um, it was $600. So think about that. That's the size of like your phone and an iPad, right? And people were paying all this to watch some um, variety shows for two hours a day. But uh, as we kind of continue going and developing and seeing how things, um, work, we begin to hit the gold era of television. Um, by 1952, there were 108 stations broadcasting to 17 million homes. And by the end of that decade, there were 559 stations and about 90% of U.S. households had a television. So we were seeing the technology grow and change. We saw the content grow and change. And so people were spending money and really diving into it. 
Um, there were more television sets sold in the 50s than there were children born. So that's quite a big difference. Um, and a lot of shows from radio carried over into television. So soap operas, um, things like The Lone Ranger, um, thing, you know, those kinds of shows that families would sit and listen to were carried over and they started becoming a visual format. Of course, we had feature films coming in and they would be played. And then we had uh, talk shows start being um, broadcast and people really enjoyed that. But one of the big powerful forces was television news. Um, it was a way for people to um, get information every day quickly. They didn't have to wait for their newspaper every morning. And they started to see television personalities come in that they could trust. During this time, AT&T um, really wanted uh, to get into the game. And uh, they had a coaxial cable and a relay network for television programming by 1951 to help uh, get the broadcast out. And uh, by 1951, we had color television come into play with the first show, The Marriage, airing live in 1954. Uh, the 50s were a big time. Not only did we um, see such a growth in people um, investing in televisions and shows and, um, really accepting the technology, but we had a few things that really changed the way that television is now. The first one was the quiz show scandal. Um, quiz shows became very popular, uh, in the early fifties. Um, people really liked the idea of watching everyday people go on, play games, win money, um, but just like any game show or reality show now, uh, the producers started to rig the show in favor of certain um, contestants to make it more dramatic, to um, put in favor with their audience. And people found out about this and they got really distrustful of them. Whereas now, you know, we're kind of like, yeah, okay, we, we get it. It's probably rigged. But at the time they really lost trust in it. And so they, um, because of that, they started putting regulations on, um, what was viable on television and what wasn't. And this was kind of the start of the FCC. And we'll talk about that here in a second. You also had I Love Lucy, which was the biggest show at the time. Um, it had a lot of monumental um, things happening that made an impact not only in television, but in society. Um, so first off, they were an interracial couple. Um, and they were the first couple to show a pregnancy on television and to have a baby. And what was neat about it was um, most television was produced in New York um, so that it could air across the airwaves, starting in the east and going across, um, but they did not want to move from LA. So they were um, really part of the reason that we um, now air at different times. Because uh, everything was really live at that point, and they um, started showing syndication. And so they just had a lot of firsts in television, and Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz are to thank for a lot of the um, advancements that we saw, not only politically and socially, but technologically as well. Um, then we have McCarthyism and the Red Scare. So during this time, um, we were really concerned as a society about communism, um, about nuclear war, and um, Senator McCarthy really took it to heart to try and seek out communists, quote unquote, and get rid of them. And one of the ways he did that was by going through Hollywood and trying to find connections with famous people or actors to show that um, no one was safe. Lucille Ball went through this problem as well because her uncle um, had a connection 
And um, so we saw lots of trials where innocent people were put on the stand and basically um, told they were communists or tried to convince um, juries that they were communists. And uh, when you talk about, you know, the end of it, we talked in newspapers about um, two journalists who really took the idea of um, telling the truth and um, stopping the idea of McCarthyism. And they did an interview with him where he could answer everything freely and they showed research and basically turned the public against him. But during that time, television and film took a big hit from McCarthyism. So uh, one of the cool things about the 1950s um, that carried over from radio was the Nielsen ratings. And I'm sure you've heard about these now. Um, some of you have maybe even seen, you get a big envelope in the mail and they ask you to start filling things out and they give you a dollar to start out with. And then from there, you can get more money depending on what you fill out. But basically the Nielsen ratings started with radio and then um, they moved into television. And now they're in uh, to streaming as well. But what it is, is it's just an audience meter about what people are watching, if they enjoy it, if they don't enjoy it. And it kind of helps producers and networks decide what kind of shows they're going to produce, to keep, and then get rid of. Um, today, Nielsen uh, goes through about 41,000 households or 100,000 people to represent the U.S. viewing audience. Um, and they use what is called the Global Television Audience Meter to really capture what um, people are watching. Um, and this goes across all devices. So television, uh, streaming, your phone, everything. They then take all of those measurements um, and percentages and they use that to secure airtime. So we saw some advancements with cable television um, and it growing very um, widely spread in the 1950s. But how did that come about? In 1948, um, a TV salesman and power line worker named John Walson um, basically told his boss that he um, had this idea and he convinced him to wire a tower directly to their business um, so that they could get this cable um, television. Uh, and so they didn't have to depend on, you know, rabbit ears and all these things. And then he started um, wiring individual homes. And by June of 1948, 727 subscribers um, to quote unquote cable television was born. Uh, he came up with this idea by using twin lead wire that he manufactured to help boost a signal for a greater number of channels. So you could get so many channels um, through your rabbit ears or the basic, you know, um, box setup, but he made it where you could get even more. Today, now, of course, we have cable. Um, we have different cable uh, varieties. We have satellite, um, streaming, but in cable itself, there's about 5,200 individual cable systems that deliver video to 5.19 million households. Um, they also deliver high-speed internet to 66.4 million um, and I always find it quite funny that, you know, people have left cable because it was so expensive and we get all these streaming services. And then there's a meme out there that says, why are we paying for all these streaming services? Isn't there just a way that we could pay for one thing and get all of these shows that we want to watch, which is cable. And so it's just a funny realization and, you know, coming full circle with that. Um, one of the other big developments in broadcast um, after cable and syndication shows was PBS. Um, so in 1962, Congress decided that um, all TVs be required to um, have a manufactured chip put into them with VHF and UHF receivers. And this basically allowed anyone with a television to get public access television. Um, so that they, you know, didn't have to rely on cable or anything like that. They could get basic stations. And then in 1967, the Public Broadcasting Act was put into place and basically um, secured the fact that there would be educational stations such as PBS um, across the nation so that children would have 
wholesome educational shows that they could watch. And uh, a year later, this brought in the creation of Sesame Street. Mr. Rogers was soon to follow. Um, and then now we have Arthur, Dragon Tales, all sorts of um, Daniel Tiger, all sorts of things to name it. Excuse me. So in the 60s, we saw this big push for educational television um, and for public broadcasting so that people could watch things without having to technically pay for them. And a lot of this um, resulted in some social and political um, powers at play. So one of the uh, biggest things in television was the Nixon-Kennedy campaign. Um, they were the first televised debate. And this was the first time that people could actually watch the candidates um, without going to see a debate in person and see more about the candidate's personality, how they answered questions, how they interacted with people. And this really changed the tide in elections. So a funny story is um, Kennedy, we all know, was very personable. Um, lots of people found that he was very good looking. Um, he was younger. And so when they had this debate, um, Nixon was actually in the fore running of the campaign and he had had a bad knee injury. And when he pulled up to the station and got out, somebody hit his knee with the door. And when he walked into the station, he was in a lot of pain during the debate. And people really found that as a turnoff, they thought he was very um, begrudging. He was not social like Kennedy and it really changed the tides when really he just was in pain from an injury, but people didn't know that. Um, so this was a big turning point in, um, how television changed politics. Um, and then we see after Kennedy's assassination in 1963, um, this is kind of the start of us wanting more and more information news wise. We, we hadn't really got to 24 hour news, um, at this point, but after he was assassinated, it was, a constant um, reminder on television about what had happened. People were replaying it. They were giving information as soon as they could get it. Um, and it was a changing point in news where it wasn't just a set broadcast at certain times. We were coming in with special announcements um, and it was just a constant flow of information. Hence, now we have 24 hour news cycles. Uh, Later in that um, decade, we get the moon landing transmission, which was a huge development in just live television. We were able to not only see um, the moon uh, take off when they went up, but also see them land on the moon, take the first steps and talk to them. Um, it's just a monumental step in television history and reporting um live news uh i still don't know how they can get transmission from the moon in the 60s and i can't get cell service on some highways but that's neither here nor there um and then lastly as we move from the 60s into the 70s um we also started seeing a shift in civil rights um and how that news played out and what was covered and how it was covered um, people were really seeing it firsthand and not just through the front page of a newspaper. And then um, we also got a lot of anti-Vietnam war leaders out of television because Vietnam was the first uh, war that was televised. It was bringing the gore and the horror and um, the political debate into the homes of people. And it was not censored the way that it is now. Um, and so people were seeing lots of things that maybe they probably shouldn't have seen. Um, and so we started seeing this anti-war establishment being um, brought into place instead of pro-war, pro-country. On top of all of that, though, um, as we shift from the 1950s and 1960s into the 70s, we really see a shift in the content that we started to want as a 
audience. Um, so the family sitcom um, or the idea of, you know, like I Love Lucy and those kinds of shows was really dying out. And instead, a lot of rural oriented programming um, started to die as well. And social conscious pro programming began to rise. Um, so instead of seeing things like Westerns and soap operas and um, all those different things, well, not really soap operas, but Westerns and uh, family sitcoms and just musicals and things like that, we um, started seeing a lot more social commentary. Um, we saw medical shows premiere. So you can think uh, your love for Grey's Anatomy for the 1970s. Um, Jiggle television, quote unquote, also came in to be um, where we started seeing a little more um, sexuality on television. Um, you know, we weren't as conservative as we were in the 50s. Uh, we also got science fiction booms. So this is where you get Star Trek coming in. And of course, we had Star Wars in the movie theaters. Um, it became a very popular genre. Soap operas took off. Now, I remember, soap operas were big in radio, um, but they became huge in the 1970s, um, and they're still going, right? Um, I know probably some of your grandmas and moms still watch, like, Days of Our Lives and things like that. Um, daytime game shows continued. We started seeing uh, telefilms, which were films made just for television, um, come about, and then we still had variety shows. With that, it kind of brings us to a point of where television is now. Um, not to say that, you know, from the 70s until now, things haven't changed. They have. But um, we've seen a big shift in the last decade or so of how television has changed as a medium. Um, right now, it is a very business-dominated um, area. Uh we talk about central production, distribution, and lots of decision-making that goes into like what profits they can make. Um, as of now, there's 1,349 commercial stations, um, and most of the stations are affiliated with a major broadcasting network like ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CW, Telemundo, and Univision. Um, and then even then, local affiliates will carry network programming. And so this is where... Um, those conglomerates that we talked about at the beginning of the semester come in and we see how they control the narrative. Um, I wanted to show you um, this little video about, um, you know, just how like screenwriters come up with a script. And um, so here we go. Getting a show from script to screen is a fast and furious process. Them crews make 13 episodes of scripted TV in the same amount of time it takes to make a single blockbuster movie. So how do they do it? This process applies to all types of scripted TV shows, both dramas and comics. But we're going to use an hour-long drama with a 13-episode season as an example. Let's say you're the showrunner. This is what the next year of your life is going to look like. First things first, you and the writers break the story meaning you plot out the major moments of the season, and then you assign writers to break the story for each episode. After multiple drafts, the script around 45 pages is created. That's about 600 pages of material for the whole season. At this point, episodes are assigned to directors and directors of photography who begin planning on their own. And then there's the art department. They're in charge of the whole look of the show. Let's say the show takes place in New York City in 1980. The art department researches the period so that everything as big as buildings and cars and as small as magazines and jewelry look realistic. Now, let's get shooting. To shoot 45 pages of material in about eight days, you need a serious schedule. A traditional script isn't all that helpful to a crew. So first, each scene is assigned a location, time of day, and actors. After all these factors are prioritized, the result is a document called a white schedule. Once shooting begins, Every episode requires a table read. That's when the whole cast gets together and reads the script from beginning to end. At this point, the director works with the director of photography to correctly block all the actors. And every scene is shot from multiple angles. A one minute scene in a show could easily take a few hours to shoot. 
Now, you might not think your typical drama would have a lot of visual effects, but something as little as a TV playing in the background of a scene requires post-production work. Ever heard of the phrase, we'll fix it in post? Here we go. A post-production team is comprised of editors, sound designers, visual effects artists, and all of the assistants and coordinators that go along with them. Editors make the first cut of the episode and give it to the director. Then the director's cut goes to the showrunners. The showrunners give notes, create a producer's cut, and that goes to the studio, which then becomes the network cut. During this entire process, things like that TV with the green screen get pushed through visual effects. Once all of the edits are final, a color corrector and sound designer begin to work their magic. The dialogue needs to be cleaned up, sound effects put in, and the entire edit needs to be mixed. Okay, we're almost done. It's now several months after writing began and the episode fully mastered its service to broadcasters around the country. But the rest of the show isn't finished. Every episode is finalized just a few weeks and sometimes just a few hours before it premieres. So when you think about um, the process that they go through and how they get shows on air and then you take Nielsen ratings and just what um, makes money and what doesn't, what goes to streaming and all these different things, lots goes into making a show. Um, so about 4,000 proposals a year are pitched to broadcasting cable networks. Um, some of those shows are picked up, of course. Some of them are not. Some of them are transferred um, to different networks. Some are put on streaming. Um, of those 4,000, 90 will be filmed as pilots. So that's about 5.5 million for a 60-minute show. Um, from there, those 90s, uh, from there, the 90 shows will be cut and one third or less will air. So they usually will take the pilots and show them to different audience audiences for testing, um, see what they like, what they don't like, change things, um, cut them, whatnot. Um, streaming ser services will provide another 160 um, pitches or um, pilots. And premium cable 45 Um these um, shows are altered dramatically um, when they finally make it to the TV sets, the 45 that usually do a season. Um, so sometimes when you go back and you watch a show um, that you've watched previously and you see like the pilot, maybe some actors are different or, you know, they change the way a character looks or acts. Um, that's what happens from pilot season to um, the show's actual season. Um, a lot of basic cable programming relies on engagement. So if people aren't watching, um, it gets cut um, or changed or, you know, depending on what's going on. Um, with that, um, in 1992, cable television um, was starting to, um, you know, get bigger lots of things were going on. And so they really wanted to make sure that um, children and vulnerable audiences were protected from things that were going on. So they decided to put in what was basic cable, um, your basic channels that you could get, including PBS and news stations. And then you could get expanded basic cable from there. That was another level of sub subscription, but it also allowed for a little more maturity, some nudity, a little more um, cuss words, things like that. Um, and so you would get things like TBS, TNT, USA, um, Disney Channel, HBO, well, not, um, HBO was more of an a la carte thing, um, but you could get like Discovery and Food Network. And it was a way to like bring in other interests and more of a mature audience. Um, you had multiple systems that could provide you with these cable options um, and they all had different types of pricing and then you could bring in different um, channels via a la carte pricing. Um, today here are some of the top broadcast networks in the U.S. and what people are watching. CBS is at the top then NBC, ABC, and Fox um, are the I mean they're the basic broadcast news channels. Uh, then you get Fox News, which is a different subsidiary with um, 
not related to Fox. Then you get ESPN, MSNBC, Univision, HGV, HGTV, and then the Hallmark Channel. Um, so a lot of people um, have been cutting cords. Um, they don't want to pay this premium price for cable. Um, and so before that started happening, though, the FCC really started to lift a few regulations on cable um, so that people could import different signals. Um, new networks could appear. So that's where you're getting like HBO, Showtime, and all these things. Um, but again, people were tired of paying for all these packages. So then you get subscription TV uh, that we have now. And then um, some people are even saying that TV is just too much and they're having zero TV homes because they just don't want to pay for it. They just think it's overpriced in general. Um, again, this gives you some idea of how viewership has changed over the years. So this is from 2017 to 2021. Um, the growth of different uh, channels. So Fox News has grown tremendously. ESPN has dipped a little bit and come back. NBC has grown. Um, Hallmark has stayed about the same. CNN has grown. Uh, TLC has grown. TBS has stayed about the same. History has stayed the same. Um, USA has uh, grown and different things. So we see a shift in what audiences want, right? Then we look at, um, here are some shows that um, are the most watched in the 21-22 season. Uh, Sunday Night Football, of course, um, and then Thursday Night Football are at the top. But then we get sh um, the show Yellowstone, which is one of the top uh, most watched shows in network right now. Uh, NCIS is still going um, with a large audience than FBI. Chicago Fire, Blue Bloods, uh, which we watch every week in our house. And you have The Equalizer and 60 Minutes. So this gives you an idea of what the majority of people in America are watching. Uh, with the success of television, even in the 1940s and 50s, up until now, um, it has been viewed as not only a great way for us to get entertainment and news, but a great way to build a successful advertising business. Um, annual billings for televisions are around $68 billion, um, meaning that we, we get a lot of commercials. The average 30-second primetime television network spot costs more than $300,000 per spot. Um, if you want a commercial during Sunday night football, it's going to be around $660,000. And then the Super Bowl is calculated by how many seconds the commercial is. Um, and some Super Bowl commercials have earned more than $5.4 billion in ad sales just for like a 30 second spot. It's still one of the like premier times that you can get um, viewership. When you look at how we're spending money on advertising on television, you can see that um, it grew substantially around 2015 to 2018. Um, and then once the pandemic hit, we saw a dip, right? Because people weren't consuming as much. They were cutting back. But we have seen it grown and then kind of level out. Um, and they predict that it will be okay as we continue forward. Um but we're spending billions of dollars in television advertising a year. Uh, who is the leading in advertising in television? Procter & Gamble. Um, they are pretty much any household product that you have um, comes from them. Uh, same with Berkshire Hathaway. Then you have Warner Brothers Discovery. Amazon is a big contender. Uh, Walt Disney, we all love those adorable um commercials that they have, Abvi, PepsiCo, um, Progressive Corp, so Flow, um, T-Mobile, and then Yum Brands. But as I've said, um, we are seeing a trend in people cutting the cord or just stopping cable in general and moving more towards 
um, streaming like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon. Um, but I think Netflix may have a dip after they have continued to raise their prices. Um, and then with the no sharing password drama. Um, but we essentially have what is called the streaming wars and it's who can get the most viewership depending on what they, uh, you know, provide for the, the amount of money you pay. But uh, as things continue to advance, as they always do, what can we hope to see in the future? Um, well, we're going to be getting into interactive television. We have seen a few shows like um, Black Mirror on Netflix where you can interact with the show and um, determine the outcome. Um, we are seeing video on demand all the time, but I think that we will begin to see um, a more direct link of watching um, more video. Um, I think social networking sites are going to start getting into this streaming war. Um, and then of course we have all the apps for streaming. We have Facebook Live um, and of course Twitter and all of those things, TikTok Live, where you can basically um, stream what you're watching. Twitch is another area that can do that. Um, and just interact with your audience. When you look at leading video on demand um, rankings, YouTube is actually number one. So people still go to YouTube to find content um, the most often. Then you have Netflix and Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, I think actually has risen um, above Netflix at this point. I think it kind of dips back and forth. Um, and you see all the different things. So we have, you know, HBO, uh, stars, ESPN plus all these different things. So that is television in a nutshell, um, from how it started to what you can expect going forward and, um, just all of the advances we've seen throughout the different decades.